We have created a medical task force with the United Way, with Acadian Ambulance, with Love Our Community, with the Schumacher Foundation and our nonprofit club to address issues with our COVID crisis and disparities in healthcare crisis. Coronavirus infection is highly contagious, mostly transmitted by droplet infection. If you experience any flu-like symptoms, including muscle pains, fever, cough, shortness of breath, please stay home, quarantine yourself, and seek medical help. It is still very important for us to avoid large crowds to decrease the spread of COVID-19. Despite being asymptomatic, if one person's infected, you could bring this home to your friends and family, thus propagating this pandemic in the community. I would have to say that it's very important during our pandemic to be sure that all of us use our mask when we go outside and we keep distance of about six feet or two arm together from each other. There are several locations in the community that's providing free COVID testing. You only have to provide an ID, insurance, and even if you don't have insurance available, they still will do the testing for you at no cost. Communities of color have been hit the hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I've got some news for you. We can take care of you regardless of your ability to pay. We have first-class care that we can take care of you. COVID-19 is not a hoax. We can stop it in its tracks. You must never go about your daily activities without wearing a mask. The mask, it will prevent the transmission and spread of this deadly virus. I'm here to talk to you about protecting vulnerable members of the population. Think about helping them attend a faith-based service online. Other things that you can do are running errands for them, like grocery shopping or medicine pickup. Scrubbing your hands, washing your hands, needs to be done a minimum of 10, preferably 20 seconds. You can use soap, water, or hand sanitizer. Minimal 10, but preferably 20 seconds. Now is not the time to put it in Faith's hands. Be proactive. Let's everyone get tested. Welcome Acadiana, I'm Dr. David Ollie, and welcome to our first live community medical call-in TV show. We will be performing these shows first Wednesday every month. I present with you with a mask, and the reason is that is going to be part of the theme. Uh, in the audience, uh, I doubt anybody has worn a mask through the years more than me. For over 40 years, 40 to be exactly, as a cardiac and vascular surgeon, I spent 12 to 15 hours, five, six days a week in a mask. We did that as surgeons to prevent infection and save lives. Prevent infection and save lives of that patient. More recently, I've done less surgery, have been a little bit out of a mask, but we have taken back the pledge again to wear my mask again. Wear the mask again at this time to prevent infection and save lives. Now, preventing infections of your friends, your family, saving the lives also. So one of the main themes, everybody, is let's wear our masks, and I want to welcome everybody to our first show. I'll take my mask off now. We have social distanced, and I would like to introduce the, uh, the panel. You saw that our topic today will be disparities in health care. I would like to introduce my partner, Dr. Raghu Patlola. Dr. Patlola is interventional cardiologist, my friend, my partner, almost 15 years. I'd like for him to say hello. He will be presenting also. Then I'll go down the line with our guest, Dr. Patlola. Hello, Kidiana. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brent Roshan will be one of our guests today. Dr. Roshan also is homegrown interventional cardiologist, been in this area for uh, about eight or nine years. I'm proud to also announce he's now a part of our partner, our, of our partnership working with Dr. Roshan. Dr. Roshan. Uh, Dr. Roshan will be talking about disparities in cardiac disease and the heart. Dr. Roshan? Hello, Acadiana. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And, and on the end, not, last but not least, Dustin Miller, 
Dustin's also a good friend. He is a nurse practitioner with, with, from, from this area. And I can remember Dustin as a uh, nurse taking care of my patients many, many years ago. He's risen in the ranks. He's now a state representative. He has family care clinics uh, throughout uh, the, the area. He's very active in education. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about rural health care, about diabetes, about medical problems. Dustin, say hello to the crowd. Hello, Katie Ann and Dr. Ali. It's a pleasure to be here today. All righty, great. Can I have the, first, the next slide, please, guys? From the standpoint, we're t our topic is going to be health care disparities. We have a very ambitious uh, 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 schedule tonight, so we're going to move quickly, and it's going to be small five-minute lectures on these disparities. We will then open up for, for calls from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the audience, and this will be live call-in. So what is a health care disparity? Well, as you can see, any type of general population area where we've got a disproportion of deaths or any type of health care condition problems, that would be a disparity. Next, please. We're going to talk about what health conditions. There's going to be five disparities we're going to talk about real quickly, one at a time, then we will open up to live calls. Our first is COVID-19. We will see some statistics, and Dr. Pat Lola will, will give us a very quick lecture on COVID and disparities. Cardiac and heart disparities are there also. Dr. Roshan is going to speak to us on that. The, these disparities are not new to us as physicians. Cardiovascular, heart, uh, diabetes, etc. disparities in our population, African American, Hispanics, has always been a problem. There has been a disparity and there has been differentiation in care and we need to, to enhance our awareness. COVID has brought it to the nation's forefront. But we know as cardiovascular physicians and primary care physicians that it's always been there and it's time we also start awareness and this is what we will do tonight. We will also talk about vascular and limb loss. This disparity is there. Diabetes and, and obesity and also kidney and stroke. So in short, uh, uh, Katie Anna, we're going to be talking about each of these health care conditions real quickly. Then we're going to open up for live call-in shows. I'd like to, uh, for, to go to the next uh, slide, please. The, the audience may have seen this. This is a disparity slide that we have created and we has been spread through the community. It's very busy. It's got a lot of statistics. I just want you to see the impression of it. We're now going to break this apart. We're going to take different statistics here, talk about them one at a time. Next, please. From this point, I'm going to now turn it over to my partner, Dr. Pat Lola. Dr. Pat Lola is going to go over these statistics from COVID. Then he's going to give us about a five-minute presentation on COVID-19. Dr. Pat Lola, please address our audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali. So as you uh, look in this slide, uh, more than 50% of the deaths in the state of Louisiana are uh, by, by the African-American population. Um, as you see that compared to that of the white uh, uh, population, the mortality, meaning the, uh, the death rates in African-American population is two to three times much higher. And about 30 to 60 percent of these people do have some underlying conditions which makes them predisposed uh, to higher rates of death. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, maybe a slide before. Okay, now uh, as you see this slide, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is for the Lafayette Parish alone. Um, uh, now out of all the uh, uh, population uh, demographics, what, you, uh, uh, what we have, uh, blacks account about 26% of the population compared to that of uh, um, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, blacks are 26% of the population and 43% of the deaths in this parish are accountable to COVID-9 versus compared uh, to the white population. 69% are the white population in this uh, parish and only 40% of these people succumb to this disease. Uh, bottom line is that blacks make up 20 to 30% of all the deaths in this Lafayette parish secondary to COVID-19 infection. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but that said and done, a very small majority of the black population are uh, uh, making avail 
themselves to this novel testing of the coronavirus. Now, these are the common symptoms. Now, these symptoms since the emergence of this virus in Wuhan, China in 2019, multiple physicians and scientists have come with certain set of symptoms which we commonly see in this patient population. Like any other viral infection, fever, cough, uh, body pains, fatigue, uh, loss of smell and taste, uh, and certain GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea are very common. But one of the most ominent, uh, ominous symptoms of this disease is shortness of breath. The important thing what you can see is that I think that uh, slide has been corrected. About 3 to 43 percent of the patients are asymptomatic, meaning even though they carry the virus, they don't have any symptoms. Now, what do we do with this class of patients having contracted the virus and without any symptoms? Uh, is, uh, this requires much deeper investigation uh, to reach to final conclusion as to how to handle this group of patients with no symptoms. Next slide, please. Now, uh, there are certain risk factors, uh, most importantly, when, the, when this uh, pandemic first started uh, six, seven months ago, high blood pressure, hypertension was supposed to be a major risk factor with a mortality of more than 80%. But when we adjusted that uh, to the uh, uh, a concomitant risk factor, uh, other risk factors, there is high, high blood pressure uh, does not have any major risk factor, is not considered a, a major risk factor of dying from the COVID virus. However, if you're having chronic lung disease, meaning COPD, asthma, or if you have diabetes mellitus, or being a black, your risk of dying from COVID virus is exponentially high. So three major risk factors of dying from COVID virus is uh, diabetes mellitus, lung disease, and fortunately uh, being of black race. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now testing for COVID, uh, move on to the next slide. Now we have three different kinds of testing uh, which we are available, which we uh, commonly perform. One is the molecular testing, and then, uh, which is the diagnostic testing, and then we have the antibody testing. Now, the diagnostic testing, which we commonly employ, comes in two shapes and forms. One is called as PCR testing, and the other one is called as antigen testing. Both of them can be, the results can be obtained pretty rapid based upon the facility where you are, where you're in. Uh, it could be obtained, the results can be back in a few minutes to a few hours or in certain situations based upon the testing board we use, it could take anywhere from five to seven days. And the next important thing is about the antibody testing, which I'm going to talk about in the next few uh, seconds. Next slide, please. Comparing these three testing, molecular testing, which is the common testing, what we use is called as PCR, also called as reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. Uh, this is what we commonly employ at Ali and Palula Medical Center and many other facilities in town. And then the antigen testing. These two are the common testings what we commonly use. Now, the PCR testing and also the antigen testing uh, simply involves collecting a swab from the na uh, nasopharyngeal area and also sometimes oropharyngeal. And in, now now, uh, in the newer testing, you can also use saliva as, uh, as the mode of testing in these uh, patients. Now, the uh, PCR testing, again, as I mentioned, it could be, uh, the results could be back in the, in the next an hour to all the way up to about five to seven days. Antigen, antigen testing is something similar to that of your pregnancy testing, which you commonly do. It's very simple, uh, uh, nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab, and the collected material is placed on the, on the platform, and it simply reads as positive or negative. And the lastly is about the antibody testing. Now, that has, it's quite uh, uh, interesting to know uh, keep in mind that that is not used for acute diagnosis. If antibody testing is positive, it simply means that you've been exposed to this virus in the last few days to few weeks, and you're possibly immune to this infection. Next slide, please. Now, again, uh, uh, the next slide after this, we spoke about this. Now, treatment for the uh, uh, virus. Uh, for this virus. Now, basically, the next slide is going to be blank, but again, keep in mind that at the present time, there is no proven definitive treatment for the COVID virus. Now, the two kinds of patients, what we commonly see, uh, see people who have bad symptoms and people who have minimal to, to no symptoms. Now, the bottom line is that if you have no symptoms, 
or minimal symptoms, these patients can be safely taken care of at home by following standard precautions, which includes uh, uh, wearing mask, hand washing, uh, preventing your contact from, uh, with the other family members, not using the same bathroom or the same utensils for a specified period of time, which could be anywhere from a week to 10 days. The problem comes with the people who are very symptomatic, meaning who have high fevers, shortness of breath with the low oxygen levels. Now, these kind of patients will require hospitalization for close monitoring and further observation. Some of these people will also require mechanical ventilation if the oxygen levels fall below the lethal, uh, at the lethal levels. The medications, obviously we have uh, certain medications, but none of these medications have been proven to be effective or safe, including uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and certain medications. But one thing which is really proven to be effective in people who have bad respiratory failure, intubated, very sick, is steroids, dexamethasone, which has been consistently shown that if, the, if these patients, sick patients, are treated with a specified dose of steroids, namely dexamethasone, this can really shorten the course of the duration of the infection, and it might even translate into better clinical benefits. Yeah, you good? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pat Lola. Uh, excellent uh, summary. We will take questions in a minute. Let's have the next slide, please. We're going to ask Dr. Roshan now to go over some of the statistics from the cardiac and the, and the heart standpoint and um, talk to us also about uh, some measures that he believes important from the cardiac standpoint. You can see right there on the screen at this moment, we are doing no-cost asymptomatic testing. You can see the sites there every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. No cost. Please come get tested get tested. All right, Dr. Roshan, let's uh, have the next slide and let's, let's present heart and cardiac problems disparities. We'll keep on going Is it, at this moment. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Right. Good evening, Acadiana. Many probably aren't surprised that heart attack, stroke, and death, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of humans in the world. With that being said, you may be surprised that 30% of African Americans are more likely to die from heart disease. Blacks have a higher rate of myocardial infarction, including heart attack, stroke, and death than every other e ethnic group, and one in third of those patients will also have peripheral arterial disease, which means blockage in the periphery, including the carotid arteries, the legs, kidneys, and arms. Next slide, please. Congestive heart failure, which means either that your heart muscle squeeze function is weak or your heart does not relax or feel as well, is also a big problem in our minority, specifically African-American communities. African-Americans with hypertension are 1.5 times more likely to develop one of these types of heart failure. With those that develop that, they are more likely to also have functional impairment and a higher death rate from acute coronary syndrome. Blacks have a 30% more likely to die from this heart disease and are twice as likely to die from stroke, higher risk of heart attack, and higher risk of heart failure. Next slide, please. Hypertension, African Americans are 60% more likely to have hypertension. Those that do have high blood pressure have an 80, and if they do have a stroke, have a higher percentage of 80% chance of dying from this stroke, which is a quite debilitating illness. And we need to do a better about it, identifying these patients and treating them at an earlier date. What do we do? The key is to improve awareness and better control of hypertension. We need to be awareness of stroke symptoms. We need to improve access for the appropriate interventions and also tailor drug treatment to the appropriate patient. In, in our community, we African Americans tend to be delayed in getting care, sometimes afraid of the doctor. And here at Louisiana Cardiovascular Limit Salvage, we afford ourselves of being easily approachable. Frontline, Dustin Miller is one of the frontline workers of primary care physicians that a lot of times are your first access. Most importantly is to get checked, get checked, and get treated. Don't please reach out more and get set up with your primary care physician and a cardiovascular physician if it's accessible to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rochon. Excellent, excellent summary. Uh, Cardiovascular disease, heart, high blood pressure, uh, higher in the black population, get checked, see your doctor. 
Let's have the next slide, please. And I'm going to ask Dustin Miller to uh, comment on uh, some of the non-cardiac, uh, diabetes, obesity, kidney, those diseases. As a primary caregiver, uh, very interested in, the, in this community. I believe he's going to do us a good job showing you these kinds of uh, treatments. And so, Dustin, let's, uh, let's hear non-cardiac stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Good evening, Acadiana. As you can see on the slide, obesity. Blacks have the highest rate of obesity compared to other minority groups in the U.S., 1.3 times more likely to be obese as compared to their white counterparts. As you can see, four out of five women in the black community is obese. And the question is, why? Why do you think they're obese? Um, as I was preparing to, speak, to, to talk today, I thought about it. And Brent probably can relate, Dr. Lee probably can relate as well. There's the older population often look at a black lady and if you're skinny, they say you're poor. That's the word, your poke. But don't understand that that person is probably exercising. Person may not have any disease. Person maybe is following the right car carb diet and exercising 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So the question is, what are we doing in our community to have a high rate of obesity compared to other, um, other groups? Next slide, please. Diabetes. We're 60% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes two times as likely to die from diabetes, and 12.3 million, or 10.8% of black Americans have diabetes and are more likely to experience diabetes-related amputations. What that say is not only are we diagnosed with diabetes, which can be led from the obesity, but we are not following the proper treatments. Is it because of lack of access? It could be. Is it from non-compliance on your medication regimen? We must be more, more specific. We must really address this as an African-American population and learn that every night is not the right thing to do is cook in the black pot, not to fry chicken, fry fish, and we must get more serious about our exercising and our food choices. Next slide, please. <laughs> Kidney disease. As you can see on the slide, three times as likely to develop end-stage renal dialysis. Four times those with hypertension have a four time greater risk of developing end stage renal disease. 138,000 African Americans in Louisiana have kidney disease. I watch this way too often in practice that someone's quality of life is hitting so bad to where they're three to four days a week going into the dialysis unit and sitting there for three or four hours a day. That can be avoided. It can be avoided by taking your hypertension medication, taking your diabetic medication, and just increasing your quality of life. I personally think in our community, education, education, education is key. If we can work together, educate our community, eat healthy, make right choices, we can beat diabetes and we can beat kidney disease. Thank you, Dustin. Is that, uh, that all? That's what you got? That's it. All righty, my friend. Excellent uh, recap. Dustin is on the uh, forefront. Rural health care. My hat's off to you. I'm honored to, to really work with him. I know he's doing things on the educational basis, on, on a day-to-day -day basis also in the community. Let's have the next slide, please, because I'm going to discuss real quickly one more subject, and that hap happens to do with vascular disease and limb loss. I'll go quickly through this, and I'm going to show you a little, uh, uh, little technical things that we're doing. You can see uh, PAD or arterial disease is more common in blacks than other racial or ethnic groups. They're actually twice as likely to develop arterial blockages as the Caucasians. And I would like for you to see those three subjects that I have next. CLI. That stands for critical limb ischemia, and that is one of the basis of what we're doing today and even our community club, which we will get into over the months ahead. But critical limb ischemia means a lack of blood flow due to this PAD that ends up with the next problem, and that's amputation rate. The, the uh, um, African-American population is twice the likelihood of having a amputation, a major amputation, than the Caucasian. So it's a significant amputation rate, and we all at this table have seen this over and over again in the entire 30 years that we have practiced. And if you can see on the other side, the last statistic, 10% of the patients present with, a, with gangrene. This is the African American population. That means it's not being treated early enough. That means they've got it, but not only do they have it, they aren't being seen, there's an education, there are many factors. We'll not cure all the disparities issues tonight. But if we can start our awareness, if we can do this, this is very important because this is where I have done most of my focus. And the single highest risk of an amputation in my 30 some years experience is the elderly, black, female, 
with high blood pressure, diabetes, and this patient will end up being on dialysis and will, uh, will likely have an amputation within their lifetime. We see too much of that. So again, we, we want to increase our awareness. And from that standpoint, one of the things that, that we now do is we have minimally invasive procedures. Now we're going to move on to questions real quickly, but I'm going to ask for two little videos because these are going to describe some of the new technologies because we have them. We have them right here in our community. I want to show them to you. These are outpatient procedures. If I could have the first video, please. This is what we do to treat the disease. Uh, this device is called the POSIS device, and this is actually in a blood clot in the vein. This is the vein. What this device is doing is that red material you see in this blood vessel is like a jello. This device is going in, and it is placing into that jello a type of medication that starts to soften it. This is turning jello into syrup. We then come with the device and we start to use this to start sucking the clot out. The first 49 patients in the entire world treated with this technique were right here in Lafayette, Louisiana with people at this table and we had helped develop this, this uh, in the years in the past and is now being refined and this is actually the treatment of choice worldwide in patients who have vein blood clots. Now that is a little bit different, but this is technology that comes, these things can be done quickly, simply. The size of this little device is about the size of an ink pen. That little wire that you see is about the size of a small spaghetti, maybe a number 12 uh, uh, pasta angelini. They're that small. Now I'm taking you to another device. This is the Roto-Rooter. This is an artery. This again is the size of a pen over a small wire and it rotates 2,000 times and that small burr in the middle is diamond coated. This is sanding down and it is taking this, this rust. You can think of this as rust in a pipe. If you had the ability to, to uh, remove this rust, this is showing it in slow motion. It is taking this, these, this blockage, this plaque, and it's dissolving them into very small micro particles. These particles you can see floating are smaller than a red blood cell. So this device goes in, shaves off these, the, the plaque or the rust in an artery, and then it allows us to come back and here we place a stent. So this is showing a rotor with a stent to treat an arterial blockage. These are now done in an outpatient setting oftentimes through very small uh, uh, needle sticks. The patients go home in four to six hours. Marked difference than the last time I did one of these live shows, call-in shows, which was 15 years ago when we had bigger devices, we had to do surgery, and, we ha and, and this was the main treatment. So this is an example of new technologies that are here in this area, and these are available to our patients. So what we will do is if there's anybody ready for a live call-in, we'd like to go ahead and, and, and take the live call-ins. Uh, uh, until then, I want to ask Dr. Pat Lowell a real quick question about, uh, about the medication hydrochloroquine. Just his opinion, because, because we may have some callers there. It's going back and forth until we got a caller. Can you go ahead and do that, please? Yes, yeah, so uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, these are old medications which we've been using for the treatment of malaria. Uh, it's a parasitic mm -hmm. uh, infection caused mostly in the Asian countries and mm -hmm. world across. So this has been older medication and it is supposed to have many other effects including immunomodulation therapy, meaning this uh, medication has been commonly used in people with immune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic like SLE lupus uh, and uh, many other uh, uh, parasitic infections. So uh, it has been anecdotally found in certain Chinese uh, population during the uh, 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 first uh, incidence of a pandemic in early December that it could have some beneficial effects in the treatment of uh, uh, COVID-19 virus. So as an emergency use, FDA and also uh, uh, many other agencies in Europe and Asia have issued an emergency use of this medication uh, in the treatment of this dreadful disease. And this has been done for the last two or three months. However, however, uh, 
uh, what we have noticed is that that this medication doesn't work it's not effective it's not efficient and plus it also unnecessarily increases the risk of complications including cardiac rhythm problems so basically now the FDA has issued that it should not be used in the treatment of COVID virus Okay, it looks like we have a caller. So I would ask for our first caller to come on in. Let's have a live call in, please. Uh, first caller. Can I take that call, please? So Dr. Pat Lola, she's asking a question you've partially answered already, but once they're in the hospital, Center on the reinfection. Can they get reinfected or not? Uh, this is a call from the audience. Yeah. Well, uh, the, I think there was two questions. So first of all, how do they treat the patient in the hospital? Well, that the way you treat the patient in the hospital is that if they're sick, uh, then to be closely monitored, oxygen levels, CT scans, chest x-rays. If they show any evidence of severe uh, uh, pneumonia, then these people will require intubation, mechanical ventilation, all that stuff. Now, the important thing, uh, the next part of the question was about can they get reinfected? Mm -hmm. It's a very important question. The answer is not clear and it's known, not known yet. But let me tell you quickly what happens. When you get infected, the body develops immunity in the form of development of antibodies. But once you have antibodies, it depends upon the lifespan of the antib antibodies. Some antibodies can prevent you uh, from getting reinfected for some few days, to weeks, to months, to years. But as far as this infection is concerned, we are not yet sure whether once you're infected, you have enough antibody response to prevent the future infection. It's not known yet. It's still been looked into, investigated. But again, there are several anecdotal instances that people who have been infected with COVID, recuperated, discharged home, back to work, two weeks later, they have similar symptoms, and then they do a test, which is PCR, and the test is positive. But also keep in mind, the test what we're using right now, PCR test, it is not 100% sensitive, not specific. It's a reasonably good sensitive test, meaning if you have disease, it'll tell, it'll speak <coughs> the truth. But still, there's a small possibility that this test is still picking up old uh, non-infective viral particles. So that's always a question. Of course, the, the patient who has just uh, recovered from the COVID virus, he could have other similar symptoms which are not necessarily pertaining to the COVID, but, would be, uh, but it could be as well be some other viral infection. But again, that's said and done. There have been some reports anecdotally getting reinfected, but what happens, what exactly the answer to this question is not yet known yet. Sounds familiar as we are learning nationwide, medical, medically wise, something new almost on a weekly basis as far as this, this uh, novel virus is concerned. And that is very perplexing. Well, it looks like we have another caller. Can we have the next caller live in please? Next caller live please. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. My mother had quick pain in London. Her doctor told her she had no oxygen, but she's never had to check for diabetes. Is there a way that we can check for diabetes? Uh, that's, a, that's a great. Want to uh, ask our diabetes specialist uh, Dustin Miller to to comment on that. This is very important because it's difficult to say oftentimes whether the patient has artery problems, vein problems, nerve problems, podiatry problems. Tell us, uh, uh, Dustin, how do you work up somebody for diabetes? So, Dr. Ali, if the, and that's a great question. The first thing you would do if someone come in for diabetes is we would do a, a hemoglobin A1C check, which shows you the average of your uh, blood sugar over the last 90 days. Um, if you're greater than 6.5, you're normally diagnosed with diabetes. If you're a diabetic person, you like to try to keep it under 7. Um, so we normally can check that every three months. Uh, we also... Um, just didn't discuss when I was talking about uh, it, if you don't control your diabetes, it can cause renal failure. And what I didn't say was well, every year you should get checked to make sure you don't have any protein in your urine and also check your glomerular filtration rate to, uh, to make sure we're monitoring that as well so you can catch it early. But as for diabetes, you can check the A1C. You, always, you also can get the patient 
Um, you can get them, order you a, a blood glucose monitor machine to where you can check it every morning. We always like to get a fast and sugar before you eat anything. Uh, we always ask that you keep a diary of it. You bring it to your next visit so that we can keep a close track of it. But uh, uncontrolled diabetes can cause neuropathy and would cause tingling and numbness in some of the extremities. Dustin, I have a question. Yes, Give me a, a, your best guess. If you have somebody who is obese and they're, they're borderline diabetic and, and you have them lose weight, how many of those can you convert to make, and sh make them to the point that they will never need diabetic care? Obesity, weight loss, diabetes. Give me a, something So you're saying that. if I've convinced them to lose weight? So if, if we've converted them and they've, and they've lost a lot of weight, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, it worked miracles. Some mm -hmm. of them, if you are successful with losing weight, you, seer, you decrease your chances of, of needing diabetic medication as well controlled, and you also decrease all your cardiovascular risk. But I tell you, living in South Louisiana, and I, I'm a perfect example, when I left college, I gained like 20 or 30 pounds. It's hard, it's hard to lose weight, and, and it takes, it takes um, a lot of uh, consistency day in and day out. But yes, if you lose weight, Dr. Ali, that's, that's a major benefit of controlling your diabetes. And I, I think that helps our cardiologists take care of the blood pressure and the heart and the things like that better so for the audience. Yes. We have another caller, so let's have the uh, next caller live, please. Next caller, please. Hey guys, it's uh, David. I have a question. So, my dad is 70 years old. He just turned 70. He's a smoker, but he doesn't have any chest pain. Uh, but his two brothers, my two uncles, they died of heart attack. And I'm curious on how I can get his, uh, my dad's heart checked. Ah, boy, okay, that's a... That's a patient with heart disease in his family, some risk factors. He's not having any symptoms, but that don't mean much. Dr. Roshan, how are you going to deal with that patient coming in? What do you do to tell whether this patient has a likelihood of cardiac disease? So this is a good general question. Good question. Thank you for calling. And very common question and very common issue. Uh, whenever someone comes in and wants to get a heart screening, it's very important for us to take a thorough history and physical. Someone may have some symptoms that they may not actually be realizing. Increased shortness of breath and activity they used to do that did not cause them shortness of breath. Chest discomfort, chest pressure, uh, sometimes radiating to the back or to the arm or to the jaw. Also increased fatigability. Uh, females especially tend to have atypical symptoms, um, including more fatigue or not the traditional Fred Sanford that I'm having the chest pain. They may have uh, you have to use a little bit more of a microscope. For your father, we would start off with potentially doing stress testing, which that would either be a treadmill stress test or we actually have technology these days where we can do a nuclear stress test that actually gives us a cardiac image showing us before the stressing modality, how the walls of the heart light up, and then after the stressing modality, that if those walls don't light up, that's indication that a hemodynamically significant blockage is not allowing that heart during a stress response to get enough blood, thus not getting enough oxygen. We also would probably do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound that shows us the wall thickness of the heart, how the heart squeezes, how capable the valves are, whether the valves are closing or leaking too much. And this is also a, something that we do to evaluate if someone may have even had a silent heart attack that they did not know which may show a segmental wall motion abnormality that one of the malls, walls of the heart moves abnormally in compared with others. Also, very importantly, risk factors include hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity, ethnicity, and also a, a lifestyle where you don't do any activity would be very important. And the more of these risk, risk factors, the more likely that someone may have a cardiovascular issue. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Again, a common question, and uh, I think that's a pretty good answer for sure. Get them checked. We got another caller, please. Let's have the next caller on live, please. Good evening. What is your question, dear? Uh, good evening. Thank you for taking my call. I would like uh, each of your opinion on hydroxy chloroquine for COVID-19. I understand Dr. Patlova already explained some on hydroxychloroquine, but I would like to know each doctor's opinion and if, it's good, and if they think it works. Okay, guys, uh, we primary care, we have internists, and you have a surgeon here left. 
Why don't uh, Dr. Roshan, you think about it, give your response, Dustin, and I'll do the same. Okay. Um, I will say that being a board certified physician, I'm obligated to practice evidence based medicine. And quite frankly, the evidence just isn't there. Not to mention, this drug can cause prolongation in something called the uh, QT interval, which, if certain patients with different electrolyte abnormalities, including potassium and sodium, is not proper, or also those that may have underlying EKG abnormalities could cause sudden cardiac death from ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. This medication has also been shown in the data, which is all we have to go by, evidence-based medicine that has not been effective, and I would not recommend it as, as the boards of internal medicine presently is not doing. Okay, Destin, what do you think? So as a nurse practitioner, I have to agree with what these medical doctors have said. Um, there's no evidence-based data that this is the best drug to use. There's no evidence-based data now stating that this is the correct drug to use. What we do on the front line is once we do the test and get the positive, we give you a Z-Pak outpatient and also some steroids. Uh, once you get inpatient, that's when these guys take over, and I think the drug of choice now is, is uh, dexamethasone and also uh, remdesivir. So once again, we uh, follow the science, we follow evidence-based data, and right now they have a, there's no evidence-based data that hydro hydroxychloroquine is the drug of choice. Dr. Pat Lola is going to give you another shot at it as an internist, you, your experience, because <laughs> I've used the drug for non uh, you know, COVID things, as far as lupus and things like that throughout my career, I've not seen side effects with it. I'm not supporting it, but what you think also, Dr. Pello? Absolutely. Now we have clear indications from FDA yeah. and many other world leading organizations, including a WHO. The, uh, recently, the trial, a large trial, including multinational countries, have just been uh, prematurely stopped because of increased toxicity and absolutely no benefit of using this medication in COVID-19 patients. So bottom line, this medication should not be used since there is no evidence to support it. I'll have to go along with my esteemed panel there. And, and, and again, it's not a, a, I'm not a medical doctor per, uh, per se, but from the, from the standpoint of doing lots of work, lots of research, lots of devices, lots of other things through the years, Boy, this, this uh, evidence-based is, is, is a real thing because I've, ex I've seen various devices used that did not turn out as well as they should have been if they did not have good, let's say, uh, uh, hardcore data and support. And, and I would be very, very concerned without, without good data here. I've not seen a lot of problems, and as, as much as we all want, that magic bullet. We want anything that, that can help. We just don't have it yet, at least from that, from that particular standpoint. Dexamethasone, as, as Dr. Pat Lola mentions, my goodness, uh, we have used that for 30 years in everything else and, and even use it in our office. What a great thing that has made a difference. Now, that's for the very sick patients. So we don't know at this moment whether that's going to have a lot to do with the asymptomatic or the early symptomatic patient. Uh, this, is, this is being decided at the moment. Looks like we have another caller. Can I have the next caller live, please? Good evening. Good evening. What is the Community CLI Club, and who and how can I join? All right, guys, I'm going to take that one myself. Our, our, our caller has, has noted the probably on, on our first uh, slide, she's asking about the CLI Club. The CLI Club is a community medical club that some of the audience may know about, some may not. What I can tell you it is that, number one, it is relatively new. It is a year and a half in existence. It was created as a nonprofit community club primarily at that time for medical education and awareness. Uh, I was one of the founders along with my partner Dr. Raghu Patlola. So, so in concept we both had been in many different types of education training through the years. We both saw a need for some enhanced new education and training in our community and we have a great healthcare community in Lafayette and we're proud of it and so it, it, it became a very reasonable thing to restart some grassroots medical education and this is what we did and this this started about a year and a half ago very humble with a hundred members who ha we had joined and the tagline there was to 
save limbs using critical limb ischemia as the entree into medical education. Once we got started, it dawned upon the both of us that we have a whole new community out there. We blinked our eyes, at least I blinked my eyes, and 15 years went by since I had done things in this community for education. And I found there were more uh, nurse practitioners, there were more, no, more non-physicians. I saw the sons and daughters of physicians who I were my contemporaries who are now in, in the community treating patients. And it became obvious they had missed the education or they needed education because it had changed. We had newer devices, newer things, and so we started it from that standpoint. Also, a big factor was as the oil field, let's say, diminished a little bit here, the number one healthcare provider, or excuse me, the number one economic provider, the number one job, uh, 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 the jobs and the, the economic uh, generators in this area have become healthcare. So it became important for, for us to get healthcare workers, non-healthcare workers, industry, um, everything from realtors to attorneys to non-healthcare involved in this. So we wanted a community service, uh, uh, non-profit organization, and this is what we did. And we have grown that club to 3,000 members. We work now with many of the foundations, uh, many of the philanthropists in this area, with the University of, of Louisiana at Lafayette, with many of the, the, the hospitals. And so we have combined in the community both medical and non-medical uh, entities in this club. Now, who can join? Everybody. Who's ever watching tonight can join because this is, is open to, to joining. This can be done whether you're in the healthcare field or not. We have websites, we have education. This will be a monthly education event that will be really under the heading of our CLI club. Again, it's nonprofit. We work at this moment with, with multiple other uh, entities here. That includes uh, Acadiana Safe, which is another program for wearing masks, which we will get into. We work also uh, with other foundations. We are working now with testing. We're working with Lafayette government. So our club is working in the community, and you can join this. You can join this by, by looking. You can, you can, call, you can uh, call in here. We can direct it, or you can also go online. You can uh, join it, www at limbsalvage.com, enter, become a member of our club, share with education, share with the events, share with this month. Again, it's a nonprofit club that, that really we would be honored to have anybody in the audience join, no matter what age, no matter what age. So guys, we've got another call real quickly. I want to have another live call. Thank you for the call on the club. Please join. Okay, let's have another call, please. Hi, my name is Adrian, and I wanted to um, hear your definition of what herd immunity is, since we've heard so much about it lately. Okay, Adrian, thank, thank you very much. Dr. Petlola, you're our COVID specialist tonight. Hmm. Uh, can you give me your opinion on herd immunity, and we'll take anything uh, uh, else, guys, that Dr. Petlola may, uh, uh, you know, you went to add. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for calling. First of all, herd immunity simply means that a large population in a community are uh, getting immune to the infection. Now, this can happen only in two ways, provided a large number of people in the community are infected and they're convalesced, meaning they've completely recovered from the infection. That's number one way to do it. And the second thing is to get a vaccine which could completely immunize the entire town, entire population, entire parish. So this way, the risk of infection uh, being propagated uh, will be significantly reduced. But right now, getting herd immunity in this era of COVID virus is not unclear. And indeed, it looks a little uh, not uh, an immediate goal because uh, many things are happening right now in terms of there is no definite treatment and the vaccines are being developed right now about 175 companies are actively working on on creating a vaccine for this virus i don't think everyone would be successful maybe a handful of them but that is not going to happen anytime in the near future if the vaccine happens then if a mass number of people are vaccinated then this will give significant immunity to the community like in, like just in terms of influenza or flu which you've been dealing with this uh, viral infection for 
years from times unknown, uh, most of the, now not everybody gets infected with the flu anymore because that's herd immunity. Even though multiple mutations of this virus happened over the years, most of the people are immune. Very few people can have this infection. Some of them can have repeated infection every year at the same time of the month. But getting herd immunity uh, at this point of time pertaining to COVID virus uh, doesn't appear uh, to be an immediate possibility. Dr. Roche, and I, we were talking about you had gone over some CDC guidelines and things. You, you like to uh, add a little bit there? Or anything well, to add to that? What I noted was mm -hmm. that I think it's very important and I think for people to be open to the fact that if a vaccine does become available, it, from the recent data that I saw, uh, should be maybe available early part of next year. Uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories, a lot of things yes. with hoax being thrown around and what have you. As once again, as all these medical professionals will attest to, evidence-based data is what we have to go with. Get vaccinated if it's available. Uh, they're currently in human trials now. I think that if we really want to get back to phase two, phase three, and largely back to our regular lives, that true answer will be a vaccine. Dustin, anything to add there on the herd I, immunity? I agree with both of those medical doctors. I think herd immunity won't happen here until we get to a vaccine due to the uh, unknown about how long the length of life of the antibody is at this point. Uh, some people, um, there's some studies showing it's average in like three months. Um, so I'm all for the vaccine. I think the vaccine is going to be safe. They're putting it through rigorous trials. They're just moving it quicker than the normal process these days. So please don't listen to the false, the false information that Dr. Rochon just, just, just uh, iterated on. Is they're trying to say already that they're going to use the vaccine and just use the minorities as guinea pigs. That is false. From my medical opinion, please don't listen to that. And when the vaccine come out, really uh, do your research and consider taking a vaccine. To our audience, very, very wise uh, uh, words have been spoken re regarding herd immunity and vaccines. Take those to heart. Guys, we have another caller. Can we have the next caller in live, please? Next caller, please. Someone's on the line. Can we have the next caller, please? Yes, yes. My, uh, Thank you. A question. My, my aunt had a pacemaker put in about 15 years ago, and she's telling me her doctors want to put or replace it with a new one. Are there any advantages to new pacemakers? All right. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Roshan to take that one off the, right off the bat, and maybe Dr. Pat Lola is, is, is a backup. Tell us about the new pacemakers. Very interesting, because I happen to have been around long enough to, to have put in the first of these AICDs, which are these major big, big pacemakers that we put in 30 years ago that are now about the size of a quarter. So Dr. Roshan, tell us about what's going on there and Pat Lola follow. Well, what I think that they may potentially be, the battery life of that device may have gotten uh, old and may need a new generator, which would just be the new battery for the device. However, is it truly an upgrade we may be talking about an automatic defibrillator, which is we see the AEDs at schools and in the communities for when people drop from sudden cardiac death. These devices have been minimized and now we can, especially in people with prior arrhythmias or weak hearts, can implant this device and it will actually be one that you're living and walking with that if you do, do develop a dangerous heart arrhythmia, it could either pace you or at the last resort shock you out of that arrhythmia and save your life. Um, also, it may be potentially a biventricular pacemaker. We now have traditional pacemakers go on the right side of the heart. Now, in certain patients with le uh, specifically a left bundle branch block, a conduction delay in the heart, we can now put wires on the left side and on the right side of the heart, thus resynchronizing or putting the heart back in rhythm, which could also improve a heart failure patient. One of the more exciting things I'm also very excited about are these wireless devices, including ICDs that are now available as well as wireless pacemakers that now can be planted in ch chambers of the heart and do not have to have wires implanted, uh, it's, it's especially in patients with certain indications or not having to want to jeopardize any of their vascular access. Dr. Pat Lola, anything to add there real quickly is we're not going to take any more calls as we're nearing the end, but Dr. Pat Lola, any additional comments? A lot of progress have been made in the field of uh, rhythm management and as, as well as the pacemakers. As Dr. Ali mentioned, the, uh, now the pacemakers are as small as the size of a quarter. Mm -hmm. Now, most of these pacemakers are very sophisticated computers. The life is about 10 to 12 uh, years, uh, but there are also many of the varieties of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think... Uh, 
uh, if you have to change the pacemaker, it's mostly because of the end of the live dead battery. That's okay. okay. Can we have a, uh, our, our closing slides, please? And, and I'd like to thank all of you for, for attending.